About six months ago, a funny thing happened. We caught it right as it's happened, as it's doing the ring. The moon is just in position. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. In technical terms, this was the view from under the path of totality for an annular or ring of fire solar eclipse. And in layman's terms, it was pretty f***ing cool. For those of you who'd like a quick debrief on what exactly an eclipse is, allow me to briefly explain with the aid of my lovely assistant, Cleo. A solar eclipse is not like a lunar eclipse. With a lunar eclipse, you have, uh, okay, you have the sun, and you have the earth, and you have the moon. And in a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the earth is cast on the face of the moon. Anywhere in the world that can see the full moon at that point will see the moon darken under the Earth's shadow, because the sun is just casting that shadow. Lunar eclipses happen pretty commonly, and because anywhere on the nighttime side of the- Cleo, Cleo, no! <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> what was I talking about? Uh, right, eclipses. So with a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth is cast on the- <laughs> Oh no. Oh god! <laughs> With a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth is cast on the, uh, on the moon by the sun. So anywhere in the world that can see the moon sees it go dark. A solar eclipse is a much more precise affair because the moon who casts a... Girl, what are you doing? Casts a comparatively much smaller shadow on the Earth. So if you aren't in the path of that shadow, you are only going to see a partial eclipse, which is when the moon only slides a little bit over the sun. So the reason why solar eclipses feel a lot rarer than lunar eclipses is that a solar eclipse is a local affair. So, ew. Ooh, oh, she's sharp. Ah. <coughs> Yo. Oh, you are so stinking cute. Ow! <laughs> so, a lunar eclipse ow, happens roughly every six months, and uh, as long as you're on the nighttime side of the Earth, which is a solid 50-50 shot most of the time, you'll be able to see it happen, it's very- OW! Yeah, no, get comfy. What else am I here for, baby girl? So, if you want to see a total solar eclipse, usually you need to travel under the path of totality to be able to see it. Because otherwise, you'll you'll see a partial eclipse. This one that we're getting, uh, this year, people are calling the Great American Eclipse. Uh, because it's gonna be visible from almost all of North America, but the path of totality is still correspondingly pretty small in that it is going to basically carve a little diagonal line starting in the southwest and going up northeast. What you, what you doing? What you doing, girl? What you, oh, okay, she's getting comfy. She's getting... Ow. Ow. <laughs> so, uh, for the purposes of this eclipse, we are traveling under the path of totality. Uh, because, oh, because one of the places it's going to be visible is <sighs> upstate New York. So we're traveling to Lake Placid. Ah! She's making biscuits out of my flesh. Whoop! I love you dearly, Cleo, but I am slightly allergic to you. Nothing personnel, kid. Now, while the path of totality is the only place where an observer can see a total eclipse, in a gradient around the path of totality, observers will see a partial eclipse, where the moon only partially covers the sun, dimming it somewhat but leaving a burning crescent still clearly visible. So while only a small sliver of the planet will experience the unique unsettlingness of totality and the rare view of the sun's corona, a lot of people are going to see the sun get weird. When I think about what it must have been like to experience a solar eclipse, you know, at any point in history when it wasn't fully known or understood, or when, you know, Joe Average, random farmer, is unlikely to know exactly what's going on. Like, obviously, you know, the narrative is like, oh, the wrath of the gods, the sun god has been devoured by a snake, you know, something like that. But I almost wonder if it would have been like, <laughs> if you take into account the fact that cloudy days happen and stuff like that, like, imagine you're just minding your business, and the sun comes out from behind the clouds, and there's a bite taken out of it. And you're like, does it normally do that? And then it's like, it, clouds go back in front of it and you're like, hmm, okay. And it gets a little bit darker, gets a little bit darker. Uh, and then it, it starts getting brighter again. And the clouds part and the sun's back to normal. And you're like, I don't know. <sighs> okay. And then like, like imagine like trying to bring that up in casual conversation later. Like, so did you guys see the sun earlier? No, I mean like, was it, was it like normal shaped for you guys? Like, did you, when it, when it was a shape, right? It was its usual circle. I would assume like a normal person and they're like, yeah, all right, man. Decades down the line, you're like, yes, the celestial alignment of the heavens, the moon shall pass her face before the sun, and cast us briefly into artificial night before 
continuing their perfect celestial dance. You're like, I fucking told you guys it was a weird shape. Partial eclipses are already very strange things to experience, even in our enlightened modern age where we know exactly what an eclipse is and that nobody's gods are getting devoured anytime soon. But even knowing that, there's still something weird about seeing the sun rise with a bite taken out of it. I almost feel like a partial eclipse is actually weirder to see than a total eclipse because total eclipses have this like aura of glorious cosmic perfection, you know, the moon perfectly sliding in front of the sun. It's exactly the right size to perfectly cover only the disk so that the corona becomes visible for the first time. Uh, but like a partial eclipse, it feels like a mistake. It's like an elder god 200,000 miles away has noticed you're in a Zoom call and is like belly flopped on the ground trying to slide through shot to not get in the way. It just feels weird. And there's also just the fact that like the moon and the sun are two extremely familiar things, you know? We see them basically every day, but we don't see them interact in this way. So you end up with this feeling of, of strangeness, of unfamiliarity in the familiar, that the sun is, is interacting with the moon in a way that you normally never see. And I feel like that's what helps create this odd feeling around partial eclipses that they're they're somehow stranger than total eclipses that they're like almost more unsettling then again i've never seen a total eclipse at time of recording so maybe it'll be weirder who knows an eclipse makes you really feel the realization that space is not static everything is just really big and really far apart, so you can't really perceive the rate at which it's moving most of the time. And when two things in space get close enough that you can actually see how they're moving, it really clicks what kind of overwhelming vastness we're just not keyed into most of the time. The moon is always moving that fast, but when we don't have the sun to compare it to, we don't notice. When I traveled to Eugene, Oregon back in October to see the annular eclipse, it was the first solar eclipse I'd ever been in the path of totality for. But it wasn't exactly totality. Annular eclipses happen when the moon is at a comparatively far point in its slightly elliptical orbit, and the very slight variation in its distance from the Earth is enough to not completely cover the sun, and instead leave a thin, burning ring of fire visible around the edges of the moon. Experiencing the annular eclipse got me appreciating the vastness of space as usual, but it also made me start thinking of the solar system as a strangely fragile, imprecise thing. Here we had the perfect conditions for a total solar eclipse, but because of a barely visible distortion in the near perfect circle of the moon's orbit, we weren't going to get one. And eclipses themselves are only as rare as they are because the moon's orbit is tilted five degrees off the Earth's orbital plane. Everything looks so clean and precise when viewed from the top down. There's a reason some historical models of the cosmos viewed it as a great mechanism of wheels within wheels, set in motion by some ineffable and infallible prime mover. But if the clockwork was really that good, we'd be getting perfect solar eclipses every four weeks. Instead of eclipses feeling like a beautifully perfect cosmic alignment, the fact that I'd never really gotten to see one was starting to feel like like a cosmic joke at my expense. So I really, really didn't want to miss this one. The path of totality for the 2024 April eclipse starts off the west coast of Mexico and curves northeast to cross a good slice of North America, including some of upstate New York, which is where we decided to try and catch it. And yes, this time it was a wee situation. I flew solo to catch the 2023 ring of fire eclipse from the west coast, but the total eclipse garnered a little more interest, in part because the 2024 April eclipse was the last one that would be visible from the contiguous US until 2044, which is a year none of us wanted to think about. So in the interests of catching a potentially once-in-a-lifetime spectacle, from the comfort of our own country, we squatted up to put together a nice little road trip into the path of totality. That said, my experience with the October eclipse taught me that even if every other chunk of cosmic clockwork slides into place to produce a perfect eclipse, the weather can never be trusted to cooperate day of. So it's kind of important to make sure the trip itself is going to be fun, even if the heavens don't deliver that once-in-a-lifetime experience we're all hoping for. So in the interests of having a generally nice time regardless of the will of the stars, we kicked things off with a tasty appetizer by having a grand old time at PAX East, and then I swung through beautiful New York City, famously the most chill and relaxing vacation destination in the world. I hung out with some friends and family, finally saw Wicked, and got rained on. Next, I took the train down to Albany, which is New York's state capital, a fun fact you would never guess from the vibes of New York City or, frankly, even from the vibes of Albany. I visited a couple museums, took a wrong turn, and had to go through a mini TSA checkpoint because it turns out state capitals have a lot of government buildings in them, and got rained on again. Oh yeah. 
This bodes well. I was particularly excited to stop in Albany because, compared to everywhere else I'd been recently, it had remarkably low levels of light pollution, which would make stargazing a much more rewarding experience. Is what I would say if it hadn't been cloudy the whole time. So instead of beholding the vastness of space, I toured a big boat, saw a big bird, and completely missed the April 5th earthquake everyone was talking about because I guess Albany was too far away to feel it. Man, New York City really is the center of the universe. My time in Albany ended on April 6th, when the rest of the gang rocked up and, after a brief jaunt around the square that contained all five of Albany's skyscrapers and an unexpected question that would haunt us for the rest of our days. Hey Twitter fans, what's up with the big hole? The <laughs> Jai Hulud. The road trip began. It was a fun two and a half hour jaunt north to our final destination of Lake Placid, a beautiful village tucked up in the Adirondacks and perfectly positioned under the projected path of totality. And if the snow was any indication, it was also still knee deep in winter, which was a fun little surprise for those of us who had spent the last handful of months down in climate change jet stream hell. We spent our first full day in Lake Placid exploring, hiking around Mirror Lake, nervously eyeing the dwindling prospects of the weather forecast, and scouting out a few promising sites to view the eclipse from. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, maybe this is a little bit less than ideal. <laughs> so how's the suspension on this thing? <laughs> Pretty damn good. <laughs> it's like we're filming a Transformers fight scene. <laughs> just Michael Bay movies. <laughs> Bayhem. It's like when we were in Iceland and there were those signs that were like, hey buddy, if you have a civilian vehicle, please don't. <laughs> Just don't. If you have the civilian vehicle, you're going to die. <laughs> Badly. And the old gods of Asgard are going to laugh at you the whole time you're falling through that river. Narrowly we escape the jaws of death this day. Oh boy. Wait, I spoke too soon. Okay, Red, I'm going to need another five exertions for you. <laughs> so you're driving down a weird hill. <laughs> We ended up settling on Mount Van Hovenberg, one of four Lake Placid legacy sites that had been explicitly set aside by the town for the eclipse viewing. While not as isolated or private as some potential spots, and thus likely to involve a certain volume of bustling crowds, it had the tremendous advantage of bathrooms, which automatically bumped it up hugely in the rankings. Also, since it had trails that went all the way up the mountain, we figured if the crowds got too dense inside, we could always just climb up a bit, like overflow parking, but for people. Yeah. I only see reasons that this would be a really smart play. Yeah, I think that this, it certainly has the most things we can do if things aren't looking good. Yeah. Uh, we've got the most space to play. We know it's going to be open because it's one of the four legacy sites. Yeah. And so the sun's there now. A few hours later, it's basically going to be here. Fine. Yeah, perfectly fine. As long as we don't get taken out by a <laughs> truck or something, we're, we're going to be fine. <laughs> And we can see the bobsledders go by yeah. on their daily commute, I assume that's how bobsledders work. <laughs> we spent the whole day marveling at the gorgeously clear skies and frustrated that the predictions for the actual day of the eclipse were still cloudy as hell over almost the entire US. But right around dusk, it finally clicked in my brain that, oh hey, really clear skies in a really small town with really low light pollution meant we could do some really good stargazing. So the night before the eclipse, Blue Noir and I struck out along the highway, found a nice little parking spot, and settled in for an hour or so to experience a taste of the wonder of the cosmos about 14 hours ahead of schedule. One thing we noticed is that absolutely no planets were visible. They all happened to be on the other side of the sun at the time, which meant we didn't see any the night we went stargazing. But if we were very lucky and the cloud cover cooperated, we could potentially see them during the eclipse. The day of the eclipse dawned promisingly clear, and we bundled up and headed to Mount Van Hovenberg around 10 a.m., four hours before the partial eclipse was due to start. While Lake Placid was already starting to bustle with Mondo tourist activity, Van Hovenberg was actually less busy than it had been when we checked it out the previous day, and in defiance of the forecast, the partly to mostly cloudy weather was thus far failing to materialize. With our spots set and the cosmic convergence on the horizon, there was nothing to do but wait. Same as last time, I brought my Celestron travel scope fitted with a solar filter, which is mandatory for pointing magnifying devices at the sun. If you don't use a solar filter when you point a magnifying device at the sun, you quickly turn that magnifying device into a deadly laser. So don't do that. After spending a handful of eternities in ADHD crystal time prison, the appointed hour was finally upon us, and it was time to post up. The partial eclipse began around 2.10ish, with just the smallest dimple into the bottom right edge of the sun. There's like a little, little nibble. I see it. I see it. It's it's definitely not quite as round as it was a minute ago. Would you care to reiterate what you just said about uh, what you thought the moon was at this brief moment? Less now that you're filming me, but sure. <laughs> uh, I looked at it and there's currently a tiny little bit of the sun taken out. Just a little bit. You can't even see it. And I, I thought, wow, the moon's tiny. 
Good job, dude. I saw what I said. The dent slowly grew as the moon gradually slid into position, transforming the familiar sun into a grotesque Pac-Man-ish abomination thanks to a conveniently placed sunspot that made the whole image very funny to me. As totality approached, the sun shrank to the narrowest sliver, but even as a bare fingernail of light, it was still startlingly bright. The daylight started to take on an odd cast, like dusk was approaching, but it still felt solidly like daylight. I also noticed this back in the October annular eclipse. Even when the moon was completely central in the disk, the ring of fire was still so bright that we didn't experience any of the effects of totality. And even when the only sunlight left was a fraction of that ring of fire, it was still basically full daylight. I risked taking off my solar filter and immediately regretted it, but managed not to melt my phone. Totality had not quite hit yet, and we knew when it did. Oh, it's getting dim. God, look, oh, look behind, look behind. Look behind. Whoa, full 360 sunset. Here we can go, gang. The sun almost entirely vanished, and its final burst of light produced a perfect diamond ring effect. In the moments before totality, the ground itself rippled with strange shadow snakes, like a heat haze cast from the sun itself. The light dwindled, vanished in a sudden burst, and was replaced by the exposed corona of the sun, no longer obscured by the overwhelming brightness of the disk itself. This is so Whoa. wild! Hell yeah. Come on, come on, come on. That's what we can look at, Santa Claus? Yes, okay. that's the corona. Wow. Oh, I see the diamonds. Yeah, yeah, you do. I'd seen pictures of the corona, but I was genuinely very surprised that it really was a sort of oddly pale gray. I was expecting the sun's corona to be the same pale gold as the sun itself, but instead it was this ghostly washed out aura that looked like a bad photocopy of itself, studded around the edge with some very small bursts of bright pinkish red, which turned out to be solar prominences, structures of plasma in the sun's magnetic field that honestly mostly looked like my camera was f***ing up. As it turns out, this particular solar eclipse happened near the maximum of the sun's 11 year activity activity cycle, so the corona and the solar prominences were much more visible this time than they have been in previous eclipses. This is so no, I weird. Think that's part of the chromosphere. I think that's just solar plasma. I, yeah, yeah. It looks, yeah. It looks a Here, red. look. It looks like the magnetosphere. Yeah. And if you tilt your head, oh, yeah. there's a little you could bright... You can see that like, there's a little red like objection. Yeah. That's the chromosphere. You're so... Oh my gosh. And outside of the telescope zone, the effect of totality was immediately striking. The temperature had dropped steadily as the sun shrank, and when the first diamond ring appeared just before the sun was completely covered by the disk of the moon, the air got full-on cold. The horizon turned sunset yellow in every direction, and the sky overhead darkened to a dusky purple-blue. But instead of setting, the sun hung almost directly overhead, like a burning hole in the sky. With the disk of the sun dimmed, the five classical planets that we had failed to see the night before were all visible in the daytime sky. Can you see? Yeah. I don't remember the ordering, but all five major planets are visible right Is now. Is it bing, bang? Uh, yeah, look at that. yeah, that's what, the, that's what the bright stars are. You can definitely see the... Oh, hold on. We're about to need to put our things back on. Glasses. Diamond ring! Diamond ring! It did not feel like three minutes later when the moon slid just far enough out of alignment that the second diamond ring formed, signaling the end of totality. The disk of the sun lit everything back up into daylight, the planets vanished, and the world went back to normal. You see, the thing about the eclipse is first it went mwah, and then it went mwah, and then it went mwah. <laughs> Correct. <Back. laughs> yeah. All right, now start reassembling. Allow me to indulge in my, uh, inner video essayist YouTuber for a minute and use my real actual face for this part for maximum efficiency. I don't know if you guys can tell, I did in fact manage to get sunburned by a solar eclipse. An eclipse is a strangely unifying thing. The whole time the partial eclipse was happening, I was getting pinged by friends and family across the US, sending pictures of what the eclipse looked like from their location, or clouds if the weather was being uncooperative, and asking how things were looking on our end. Outside the path of totality, things were pretty normal. Honestly, if you weren't looking at the sun with, you know, standard issue eclipse glasses so you could actually make out the shape of it, you might not even notice anything was weird. Under the path of totality, the story was completely different. You gotta understand, I've seen pictures of total eclipses. I've seen drawings from the 1800s, time lapses, high-res NASA photography, much better than I could ever get with my analog telescope that I have to point by hand and my phone camera. I've seen the highest quality images you can get of eclipses. And long before totality, I knew every stage of the process, down to the shadow snakes, the, the two diamond rings, the omnidirectional sunset, the visible planets, the twilight dusk effect during the day. 
I knew what everything was going to look like. The only surprise that the eclipse held for me was how emotionally impactful it was to see it in real life. There are a lot of things I've never seen in real life, and a lot of things I've seen but been frustratingly unimpressed by. And there's this feeling I get sometimes when I'm experiencing something I've wanted for a while. It's not a good feeling. It's sort of like this simultaneous awareness of the inexorable passage of time and an inability to feel engaged with the present moment. So I'll be experiencing something that's unique and special and potentially once in a lifetime, but I'll just feel like a thing is happening. It won't feel momentous or magical, and I won't be able to make myself feel the gravity I wish I could, but I can feel the seconds of that experience ticking away, and then it'll be over, and life is moving along, and I've done the thing I wanted and felt nothing, and now I'm back in the normal status quo and I can't go back to try again. I'll see a painting I've seen pictures of in books, and it'll be beautiful, but not more beautiful than the pictures I've already seen. It won't make me feel more just because I'm seeing it bigger. And this is a part of myself that frustrates me, because I know that there's joy and beauty in these things. I see other people experiencing them. It just feels like I can't crack the code to get it out in time. That's part of why I didn't seek out the 2017 Great American Eclipse. I could have. I didn't really have anything stopping me. I mean, I think I was in school, but like, whatever, right? You can skip days of college, it's fine. <laughs> Teachers, students, I'm, I'm joking, uh, but you can uh, call in absences, it's fine. College is not like high school. You can ask to walk out, and sometimes they'll let you. I didn't have anything specifically stopping me, I just didn't. And I regretted it later, especially when the weather wasn't cooperating, or when the annular eclipse reached totality, but it wasn't like totality totality, and there was still enough sun that it was basically daylight, and it was so overcast we wouldn't have been able to see anything else anyway. I'd missed out on a total eclipse just because I hadn't bothered to put myself under it. And why would I? It's not really doing anything weird. The sun, the moon. So they go in a line. So we see a part of the sun we don't normally see. How striking could that really be? It is no secret that I love space. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of a secret on account of how I never shut up about it. I've always loved space, and one of the very first existential crises I had to wrangle with when I was very young was this sudden realization that there were these beautiful vistas out in the cosmos that I would never, ever see. Sunrises on gas giants, flying through a planet's rings, the birth of new stars, even just Earthrise from the surface of our own moon. There is an awful lot of space, but once you do enough stargazing, you kind of start finding out that there really aren't that many surprises. The star's most noteworthy characteristic is how little they change and how reliable they are, so we can base calendars and civilizations on them. But after months of gazing and tracing the same distant lights, I found myself wishing space had more happening in it, so it could surprise me once in a while. And while anything is interesting the first time you see it, everything will get old the hundredth time you see it play out the exact same way. Stargazing was peaceful and calm and boring. It kind of feels like being trapped in a time loop after a while. Sometimes I will remember that I'm an artist and I can just draw the things I want to see, but, you know, still. My inability to experience the grand beauty of the infinite cosmos is a bit of a profound sorrow that I suspect I'll never fully accept. And that's to be clear. <laughs> to be clear. That's a good thing. I don't think I would want to accept that there are things I'll never get to do, because I kind of like who I am when I'm yearning for impossible things. It's sad, but it's like the good kind of sad. So all that to say, I had every reason to worry, in my heart of hearts, that watching this eclipse would not mean much to me. That I would see this thing I'd seen pictures of, and I would feel nothing. And I didn't want that to happen. So that afternoon under the moon shadow, I was shocked pleasantly at how much I felt. Together with friends, a parking lot full of hundreds of strangers, I was surprised at how excited I was to see the total eclipse play out so gorgeously, so perfectly, exactly the way I expected it to. Oh my gosh! Woo! I have it! I have it! The diamond ring! Whoa. Whoa! Shadow snakes, omnidirectional sunset, diamond ring one, corona visible, solar prominences around the edge, diamond ring two, the brief shot of all the planets in the sky. It felt otherworldly. It felt magical. Even though it was the opposite of that, I knew exactly what was going on. It was the most demystified it could have possibly been, and it still made me feel something very profound. At one point in the totality, I physically realized I was jumping up and down. The whole drive back, I, kept, I was catching myself grinning at nothing. There wasn't really a logic to it. 
And I think that's kind of foundational to how this works. Logically, this is a very normal thing that happens sometimes. Feelings don't really react to logic, as frustrating as I find that sometimes, and in this specific case, it, it actually served me very well. And I talked earlier in this video about how there are so many superstitions about this sort of thing, and, and people in the past were like, this must mean something profound, this must mean something divine. And I was like, I don't really believe in any of that stuff. So clearly I will be immune to the sense of nature's wonder. Turns out, I had the causality reversed. <laughs> I think, you know, people are like, this must be a divine thing because it feels so powerful. Not, this feels powerful because it must be a divine thing. It's very hard to explain how striking it was. Because these pictures are good, the video is good, but it does not capture how it felt. The art of being a storyteller is being able to evoke that emotion in people by painting them a word picture, and I don't think I am succeeding in doing that. The way I would describe it to try and evoke the vibes, day and night collide, and you're standing there under this purple-blue sunset, but the sun's not gone. It's right over your head, shining like jewels. It's like a hole in the firmament of the sky. It's like the eye of a god staring down at you. There are stars in the daylight sky. You're standing under an impossibility. Your entire reality is recast in that moment because this isn't impossible. It's not even all that rare. You just get to see the clockwork. For a brief moment, you get a look behind the curtain Eclipse imagery is absolutely everywhere in media. I've been thinking about a, a trope talk on this, so stay tuned eventually when I figure that out. But eclipses are just these naturally dramatic things. They look so cool. The, the black circle with the diamond ring shining around it. It's a beautiful visual. People put it on everything. It's not the most striking part of the eclipse. It's the center of it, obviously. It is the eclipse. For me, it was how dark it got. Truly, Nighttime in the middle of the day does not feel like it should be that strange. And for me, honestly, seeing the planets is what really made it. It's this strange feeling of unification, which I guess is appropriate because of course it's the moon and the sun sliding into alignment, but it's... <laughs> I mean, I guess it's just a solar system family photo, basically. It's like, finally, we can get everybody in the shot. The sun is so bright. This is something that really surprised me when we were there. Even the tiniest sliver of the sun's disk visible made it feel like full day. It felt like it was a little bit dim, but it wasn't any dimmer than it would have been on an extra cloudy day. It was only when the moon slid fully into place that the effect really hit. It turns out a fraction of the sun is still the sun. You look up at the sun and you're like, there are billions of stars in the sky right now, but I can't see any of them because the sun is washing them out. But it's there all the time. And like, I'm standing on a globe, spinning through space all the time. And I think it's easy to forget that, especially during the day or in a city with a lot of light pollution or even on a cloudy night, you know, the world starts feeling very small. And on a cosmic scale, it kind of is, but that's just because scale is a 100% relative concept. Like, yeah, on the grand scheme of things, the Earth is tiny compared to the vastness of the cosmos, but on another scale, the Earth is enormous and the universe is even bigger and we are a part of it all the time. I just think, <laughs> space is so cool. Can you tell, can you tell this is a thing that I think about a lot? Sometimes, Having a special interest is a little bit like chewing the same piece of gum and hoping the flavor will start coming back. So it was very nice to know that I could still feel this way about space. It turns out, no matter how much I overprepared or studied up, I could not spoil the experience of standing under an alien sky and feeling the universe turning around me. I may not get to go to space, but the cool thing about living on a planet is that we are already in space. The very nice thing about this is that the sun and the moon are moving in the same direction, which means you can tell where to put your camera so that it moves through frame just because they basically form two points of a line. The benefit of uh, a vertical camera. Yeah. I do not have that, so I gotta keep adjusting. Oh, and it hasn't been moving in the same direction. It means the eclipse was gonna last a little longer. No. Nope. Rather than if they're... No? They're moving in the same direction because the Earth is rotating. They always move in the same the direction. <laughs> I don't think there's ever gonna be an instance where the moon is... The moon is in retrograde this week. 
It's okay. This isn't your area of expertise. That's fine. <laughs> what if today's lucky 10,000? We did get that on time lapse. Though. It's not. This isn't even time lapse. This is just on video. No. <laughs> 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 what are you videotaping? Me being a dumbass. I, I'm Dumb videotaping the, the the sun and the moon. I don't know what Blue's up to. <laughs> Blue. Yeah. How many moons does it take to cover up a sun bolt? Uh, we'll see in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if that even is the moon. <laughs> I don't know what to believe anymore. 